Okay, good morning, welcome back. I hope you are recharged, energized, strengthened by this week. This is the plan for the week. Today, as usual, I'll go through one of the chapters from the second textbook, A Social History of the Media. I have created, as usual, a page with notes on chapter four. Eventually, my notes about chapter five will also be added. I'm still trying to play catch up with the program, but eventually I'll get there. On Wednesday, we will continue with the demonstration of the feature of DocuWiki, which was introduced the week before the break. And keep in mind that Friday before the break, we had a hands-on activity uh, focusing on DocuWiki during that activity uh, students who were in the class had access, could register in order to log in and work on their DocuWiki page, which is the last digital assignment and the last of the assignments before the paper and the oral presentation. So if you were not in class on Friday, if you have not contacted me yet, send me an email and I'll send you back your username and your password and the link to the page where you can have access and work on a page both during this week's Fridays hands-on and also for the digital assignment on Dr. Week. Okay, and of course you have the videos from week seven if you want to review my demonstration of the app. So the readings are just the only, the only assignment so far and then eventually uh, the digital assignment on DocuWiki will be due. Uh, I have corrected all of the assignments on the Evernote experience, your presentation and analysis of videos by users or by experts of Evernote from the last two years. And I emailed back each student, my comments and the grade. So check your email in case you don't find your uh, grade and assessment, just let me know. Or if you've never submitted that assignment, please contact me. If you didn't, of course you must have received uh, a message from me to that effect. These are the notes of chapter four entitled Technologies and Revolution that I will use today for today's class. And again, keep in mind that the purpose of this discussion in class is to allow you to navigate a chapter such as this one, full of names, full of dates, full of references. When the time will come for the final exam, you will not be tested uh, on those dates, on those names, on the details of the example. The final exam is based on essay questions. The questions will be more general in nature and you will be asked to engage in a discussion of media and the history of knowledge of the kinds that is similar to my presentation today where i will just mention a few names only a few dates and discuss gen general changes that occur in society and how they uh, directly or indirectly impact the development of new media from the past coming to our own digital era. Of course, feel free to interrupt me for questions or comments. The first section of this chapter is about the industrial revolution and about the use of the word revolution. Of course, industrialization got its start from the development of the steam engine. The steam engine was not invented by James Watt. 
it was perfected, he perfected during this period between 1763 and 1775, he perfected the steam engines that were created by others and steam itself was a very well-known source of energy. Even the ancient Greeks were familiar with steam, but never they were never able to apply their knowledge of this technology to uh, production the way it happened during the 18th century. The reason why I introduced these dates, 1763, 1775, is to add evidence to the argument that is developed by Burke in this chapter, that is to say that there is a profound connection between the Industrial Revolution, which was called so uh, later on. Industrial Revolution is a definition introduced by a famous French economist, uh, uh, Adolphe, Jérôme Adolphe Blanqui, in 1827, he, he was young himself, he had been born in 1798, and there is a profound connection between the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution. The French Revolution that started in 1789 and that caused the overthrow of the monarchy in France, which of course was short-lived because the revolution was then uh, controlled by Napoleon, who became self-emperor, and after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, after the final defeat at Waterloo, there was a period of conservatism where the monarchy was restored and uh, the, the old conservative values were emphasized even more than before the French Revolution. However, as I said, there is a connection between the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. There is plenty of historical evidence that the existing regulation prevented industrialization to develop properly in France, and that the people who were involved, the entrepreneurs and the people who were involved with the development of the industry in France supported the overthrow of the monarchy to eliminate those archaic rules that um, kept the level of growth for the revolution, for the industrialization and the economy in France at a slower, at a much slower pace. The Industrial Revolution from the very beginning was not seen as something completely positive. Immediately, uh, there were reasons for criticism. There was from the very first century of the Industrial Revolution the, an awareness that pollution was one of the results of industrialization, as well as a deep exploitation of the labor force inside the factories. The conditions of work were terrible, and they caused, in fact, frequently loss of, loss of health, shortening of life expectancy in those who worked in those factories, in those conditions. There was the understanding that industrialization affected the landscape, modified the landscape in areas where it developed with the addition of new buildings, densely uh, placed, and also with the presence everywhere of smoke coming out of the chimneys of the factory. Smoke became uh, a staple in the landscape of many urban areas in Europe, especially in the countries such as England and France, who uh, developed industries. Eventually, this affected also the media in a more direct way, because during the 19th century, the printing press itself took advantage of the steam engines, and the steam press is the industrial version of the traditional printing press that allows newspapers, for example, to be printed daily and to be printed in tens of thousands of copies, to be printed several times a day, 
because in the past, during the day, you would be able to buy different editions of uh, the newspapers with the latest news. And uh, uh, later, even during the night, even during the night, you would find some newspapers who came out at night uh, covering the news that came out during that portion of the day. Of course, when you talk about the criticism of industrialization and the Industrial Revolution, you have to mention Karl Marx, who was born in 1818, right after the Industrial Revolution became apparent in many European countries and developed his set of theories to show that the evils of industrialization and capitalism were structural, were not mm, uh, the result of poor decisions. They could not be corrected. They were intrinsic to the system and therefore the whole system had to be reworked in terms of who controlled the means of production. David Landis was a Harvard professor of economy, a traditional believer in liberal uh, capitalism, who wrote, published in 1969, a famous book about industrialization, recurring to the myth of Prometheus, who according to Greek mythology was inventor of fire, to show how deep the change caused, or the changes caused by industrializations were. And Burke summarizes the thesis from the about Prometheus, mentioning three aspects that allow us to understand the changes caused by industrialization in society. The first thing is that instead of relying on human and animal strength, which were the primary sources of energy before the 18th century and the application of the steam engine to industrialization, together with the other traditional sources of power, such as water and wind, of course, these sources of energy were replaced by a form of power that was in inanimate, that was mindless, that was external, but not clearly interfaceable. The interface with this form of power was not as direct or easy to negotiate as in the case of the use of other humans or animals, such as horses and oxen, or the use of wind and power afforded, okay? So you have something that is external to the individual and not easy to control. Naturally, this is a long process. When we talk about the Industrial Revolution, we, start, we talk about a phenomenon that is not confined to the 18th or the 19th century, and therefore, if for millennia the agricultural routines had dominated the daily lives of the majority of the individuals in society and those agricultural routines were completely different from the routines of the factories because the pace of work in agriculture in a traditional agricultural society changes from season to season, from period to period from day to day. So there are periods of intense application and work depending on the needs for seeding, for uh, picking up the crops, etc. And periods of uh, relative inactivity during the colder season when it's difficult to be outside. There are moments in the day when the climate allows a more intensive labor, and moments when people in agricultural society would rest or work less intensively. Those routines did not change only when industrial factories were introduced in society and employed a lot of people, a growing number of people, until most people would be working in factories rather than in the fields. Even during the late Middle Ages, you have the development of something that is somewhat similar to the routines of the industries, which will, of course, 
uh, be developed in the form of assembly lines eventually. And, and this, this process is completed only in the 20th century within the automobile industry. Even in workshops during the 15th and the 16th century, you see some industrial routines, some routines that are repeated identically from one shift to the other, from one day to another, with some specialized activities entrusted to a single individual, whereas inside the agricultural societies, the farmers would take on different roles during the year and depending on the needs of the farm. So, for example, we've mentioned how the printing press itself is the first form of industry, exactly because you have a series of routines that are repeated over and over in the same way. And within the shop of a printer, you have workers assigned exclusively to certain tasks. And this process continues even after industrialization was uh, introduced and of course you need to remember how steam is then uh, accompanied by the development of other sources such as electricity electricity introduced in the 19th century but exploited for production mostly in the 20th century and by by nuclear energy solar power etc and industrialization doesn't replace the traditional the traditional sources of power. For example, in reference to production or in reference to transportation. Because for example, water mills and windmills remained operational until the beginning of the 20th century. So a lot of communities in Europe as well as North America relied on water and wind to move the mills that produce flour, an essential ingredient uh, in, in their diet well into the 1900s. And the same happens with wind applied to transportation, even though steamships were introduced and widely used during the 19th century, sailboats used not only for fishing but also for transportation were used worldwide into the 1900s. It's really until the 1920s that the majority of goods is transported on board ships that are moved by an engine, a steam engine or a diesel engine, right? So don't think that just because you have the steam engine, everything changes within one or two generations, okay? And this is especially true if you live in a place or you travel around a place such as Long Island and you see uh, the evidence that sailboats were in use until the 20th century in a commercial fashion, right? Same with horses. It's not like people cease to rely on horses as sources of energy in agriculture or to transport goods. In fact, just think of World War II, where most armies were highly mechanized, and yet even the German army in 1943, the German army being uh, the kind of army that embraced mechanization, embraced mechanized war, in 1943, half of the supplies in the German army were being transported by carts, carriages with horses, not trucks. Trucks only uh, uh, were used for half of their supplies. Bicycles were used for transportation of course, the bicycle is introduced later on during the 19th century and perfected by the standard bicycle is perfected by the 1880s. But bicycle being a means of transportation where human strength is used for locomotion to move around, bicycles were used as a primary means of transportation in plenty of countries around the world until the 1960s. Of course, there were automobiles, but the majority of people did not have access to an automobile in most countries uh, until the 1960s or 70s, okay? So keep in mind the long duration of these processes. The other 
uh, element that allows us to understand the Industrial Revolution, according to Landis, is the fact that mechanical devices replaces human, as, as we said before, as sources of energy, but they also replace human skills. That is to say, you have the impression that the human is an appendix to the machine rather than vice versa, humans taking advantage of the power of the machines, okay? Because in the industrial factories of the 18th century and the 19th century, a lot of menial tasks are assigned to those who work the assembly lines. Re simple, repetitive tasks of the kinds that at this point have been replaced by uh, bots by robots using artificial intelligence, right? The final aspect that comes with the Industrial Revolution and the kind of element that justifies the connection we suggested before between the French Revolution and Industrial Revolution is that in order to support the production of goods in the industrialized system, you need to have a steady and quick supply of raw materials. Therefore, you need to be able to move those products around and get them to the factories in a timely fashion. And that's where the older, more feudal societies represented an obstacle to the development of industries because a country such as France before the French Revolution was subdivided administratively in such a way that any kind of product moving through France would have to cross administrative local barriers, be stopped, be inspected, be subject to a local fee, right? And this applied not just to product, but anyone in a place such as France and other European countries during the 18th or even the 19th century, even if you traveled as a tourist, let alone as a merchant, you would be stopped, you would find the gates to enter the city, not as a measure to defend the cities from attacks, but rather to enforce tariffs and fees for the importation or the transportation of goods. And therefore, if you entered any French city, but even uh, uh, an Italian city, for example, some of the German cities, you would be stopped by custom officers, they would ask you what you were transporting, they would inspect your uh, baggage, and then they would decide what uh, goods you were bringing in that you had to pay a tariff or a fee on, and sometimes even things as simple as a book could, be, uh, could have a fee imposed because you were going through that territory, uh, and, and therefore everything was slowed down. During this period, there is a lot of emphasis on the process of invention. In the literature, in the essays, during this period. Of course, there is an understanding that invention is distinct from discovery. Invention means the application of knowledge, not just the acquisition of new knowledge. And it is placed within the economy. So you see how things are converging, how these things are not completely removed from our understanding of what the knowledge industry is nowadays. The roots of this process, of this convergence of knowledge with the economy is indeed found in the early modern periods and their changes. And how do you associate an invention with money? You develop the system that is known as the system of patents. And during the 18th century, you have an increased number of patents being registered in countries such as France and England and other uh, places will follow suit. Of course, it's easy to understand that more often than not, inventions do not originate in one place only, are not the result of one person's uh, effort only, most inventions are invented at the same time by different, or around the same time by different people in different countries. They're polygenetic. There is one, there isn't one point of origin of genesis. 
Therefore, what is more important than being responsible for an invention? What is more important is being the first to register an invention. And this paradoxically generates a different process where you are trying during the 18th and 19th century to register an invention before you invent something. Because when you register a patent, you're allowed to include a certain amount of details, but you didn't have and this is true even in the 1900s, you didn't have to include all of the details. And in order for the patent to be valid, there was no process of verification that what you were registering was working. So from this point on, you have this kind of competition where several times what you see happening is that someone is registering an invention that somebody else will complete, that somebody else is working on, more quickly and more efficiently. For example, the, the most uh, conspicuous example would be the patent for the automobile. The automobile industry in the US was slowed down by the fact that someone registered a patent without never creating an automobile. He created the automo one automobile only after he registered that patent and for a long time, people such as Harry Ford and other entrepreneurs in that area had to pay a license on every car they produced, but they brought this guy to, um, in, to court in order to prove that uh, uh, he had not really invented the automobile and eventually got rid of those licensing fees. And of course, this caused a lot of legal disputes and increase the necessity for international law because what happens when you register uh, in a country but someone else in another country copies your invention and refuses to pay a fee or a license. Within the invention, the area of invention and the emphasis on invention from the very beginning, you see a particularly emph particular emphasis on transportation which is key to the development of the industrial system. So the book mentions the British Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce, which in 1760 created a list of the key inventions of the time. And it's a very modern kind of list when you understand the implications. The list starts with inland navigation, which means to be able to ship goods, products, raw materials with boats inside uh, a series of rivers and canals. And of course, uh, all countries that already had rivers developed a system of canals to connect those rivers and being able to move uh, those products because it was still the most efficient way uh, of moving products uh, during that time and throughout the 19th century. Uh, therefore, we find evidence and we find this label in the literature of the time that there is a canal mania in countries such as England first and then the Netherlands and then France and then even the US, especially after the US acquired in 1803, acquired Louisiana from Napoleon, and they had control of a vast area with the Mississippi River and the rivers that are connected to the Mississippi, and then they developed a series of canals to potentiate that system. In the case of New York State, you might be familiar with the Erie Canal, and when you travel upstate, you still find remnants uh, of this system uh, for example, uh, if, you, if you go um, up north, you find Lake Tuscarora, which is an artificial lake that was created exclusively in order to in, uh, uh, insert water, add water to the Erie Canal when there was enough water naturally. So it was an artificial basin storing water, and whenever necessary, they would open the gates and transfer part of the water into the Erie Canal so that boats and barges could navigate that. And the Erie Canal was essential to the development of the economy 
of Unity of State together with the Hudson, of course. From the Hudson to the Erie Canal, you could access the system of the Great Lakes and other industrial areas. What's interesting about this is not just that canals were being built, but the fact that you need to legislate over the construction of these canals, right? You need to uh, acquire land or give someone permission to use private land in order to build a canal together with a network of infrastructures that are necessary to maintain canals, right? So that's the beginning of what we call today the administrative state. That is to say, yes, you have a parliament in these countries, some of the countries you have a monarchy which is involved directly in the executive power, but then the power to build and maintain canal, the power to control the land that will be affected by these operations, by these infrastructures, is delegated to a series of committees first, and then administrative agencies that control the society and territory in a different way, because traditionally the interfaces between society, at least the top of society, because in these societies only the wealthy had power, political power and political rights, but the interface was always between those with political rights and the government, and now you have the government delegating powers over the territories to administrative agencies that do not interface directly with the citizen, right? Because they have a power that cannot be affected or touched by the individual, right? They're third to this dialogue between the citizens and the government and shielded from the consequences of their actions. Continuing with the list of inventions according to this British society that influenced the technologies that influenced the revolutions of the time, you have the instruments to calculate the longitude of ships at sea, so you can know exactly where you are. And during the last 20 years, you find uh, several uh, very exciting, easy to read books about this invention, and of course, they also mention wheels, carriages, and roads. Now, even before the steam engine was applied to the construction of trains, and even before motorized vehicles were introduced, a big change was the introduction of different road surfaces, because the speed of carriages drawn by horses was limited by the nature of the pavement. And so, for example, Macadam is a big change. Macadam is the name of uh, a technique to pave roads that predates the modern invention of asphalt. And that's the name of, the, of an engineer, John Macadam. So Macadam is a kind of road that allows carriages traveling on it to travel more quickly which is applied to turnpikes, to the precursors to modern highways. So the major arteries of transportation allow carriages with products and raw materials to travel faster than five to 10 miles uh, on that. Same with iron bridges. What is the difference that iron bridges makes before, even before motorized vehicles are created? Again, Whenever a bridge was found on a road, carriages had to slow down because bridges made in, with, with wood and left exposed to the, to the, to the weather uh, could be frail, precarious, kind of dangerous, right? Once you have iron bridges, you don't have to slow down when you're driving uh, over them. And of course, eventually you have the invention of the steam locomotion which will happen in the 1900s. Steam locomotion is applied first to the road, and you have a series of steam carriages developed, especially in Great Britain, uh, during the early 1800s. But they were short-lived, they were experimental, they were never systematically used. And then the first systematic use of steam for transportation comes with the trains. George Stevenson is one of those who 
uh, pioneered this technology and the most successful format of his invention was the famous rocket from 1829, which was able to travel between 10 and 30 miles per hour, depending on configuration and uh, loads. It is said correctly by Louis Manford that capitalism during this period developed a dependence on coal and iron. Those were key elements and drove international politics and foreign affairs and wars well into the 20th century. The train, of course, was called an iron horse. And the fact that iron was included in the label tells you how the invention was being uh, seen. And of course, the trains allowed for the experience of speed, which was different. So the levels of speed reached by trains during the 19th century were such that no one had experienced such speed uh, before. However, the real inclusion of speed in culture and uh, the inclusion of speed in the human experience of modernity will happen with the automobiles, okay? Because there is anecdotal evidence that people talk about the speed of trains, including a lot of um, criticism, the assumption that um, the speed of trains at some point will be such that people will not be able to breathe. And this was true, especially with the first trains, which had open cars and then of course uh, with, with uh, cl enclosed cars the experience of the train was not really associated with speed exactly because the train was seen as a moving living room of sorts where you sit you read you talk and you don't feel the speed of the train and the feeling of that speed will come with the automobile even when the first automobiles were significantly slower than the trains. This, the introduction of the train, changed the patterns of mobility for an entire society. For example, it affected tourism in, in a big way to the point where people would go to uh, locales that were connected by trains and stay away from other places. And this provoked reactions by the end of the 19th century. You have a British writer who was also a travel writer. His specialty was travel to Italy and especially travel to Tuscany. And in The Road to Tuscany, published by Maurice Hewlett in 1902, he complains that at this point, the places that you can reach as a tourist by train are, have, have nothing surprising. Everything has been described to death because people just go there. And the very fact that large numbers of tourists can access certain places by train has homogenized culture, has globalized the culture of those places that have become cosmopolitan. And therefore, he will claim that he's relying on traditional means of transportation, walking from place to place, or using a carriage, a horse and carriage in order to see places that are outside of this network of tourism that has been explored and has nothing different to offer. And his claim is that there are still exotic places in Italy, even in Tuscany, but you can only get there if you walk or if you travel with a horse. When you talk about railroads, keep in mind the consequences of the establishment of transcontinental lines. The first transcontinental railroad was completed in 1869, and pretty much wherever the train gets, you also find telegraph poles. So you have the transportation of humans and goods with a train, you have the transportation of content, media content, information with the Telegram. Going back to the British society who came up with this list, keep in mind that 
uh, the American Benjamin Franklin was also involved with one of the committees uh, it, when he was he visiting England and he himself was an inventor, right? He invented bifocal glasses and experimented with electricity as you may have learned in primary school. One of the concepts that uh, becomes a theme throughout this period is the idea of conquering nature, right? You have the natural sources of power, the natural sources of energy, human strength, animal strength, water, wind, uh, being replaced by machines. And the extension of this process is the idea that now finally humans will be able to conquer nature. And that is part of the literature, the popular literature of writers such as the French Jules Verne, who talks about going to the moon, who talks about going into the depth of the oceans, etc. Uh, Gas is another paragraph, another section of this chapter, and it reminds us that gas illumination was introduced in 1805, and everything is connected to the ongoing industrial revolution, because the first places that enjoyed the benefits of gas illumination were the workshops. Because the, the day for a typical factory worker was a minimum of 12 hours, but often could be more than 12 hours, and therefore you needed illumination in order to work effectively uh, for those long hours. Then, after the workshops, where is gas illumination introduced? The streets and the bridges, in order to improve the quality of transportation. And before gas illumination enters the homes, it is introduced in theaters because, of course, it is part of the show to see something that you cannot find everywhere. And because, of course, theaters often offer evening and night shows. So it is introduced eventually in homes, changing patterns of sleep of people. And it does change the landscape in a way that we have kind of forgotten because uh, in the past, during this period, you would have seen that gas holders at the time were called gasometers everywhere in urban areas. And at this point, uh, there are a few surviving gas holders. Sometimes they're not operational anymore in European cities and in modern American cities, they're usually outside of urban areas. Even on Long Island, you find them, but they're out of the principal network of roads. And, of course, chimneys everywhere, modifying the landscape. This idea of civilization and progress introduced by industrialization is the idea that there is a constant, ongoing process of development. And in, this, in, in regards to this, the discovery and the application of electricity becomes the best metaphor, even before electricity is really applied to industry, of modern society, where change is constant, where time, the pace of development and production has changed, and electricity being seen as this constant flux of energy reflects this idea. Of course, as we said, electricity is applied to the telegraph before it is applied to production, right? The telegraph is based on electrical impulses and allows for constant movement of information. Then it is introduced for illumination in theaters, starting with 1879, and then at the end of the 19th century is introduced for transportation. Electrical cars are nothing new, in fact, in the 1900s, about a third of all moving vehicles relied on electricity, another third on steam, and only a third on internal combustion engine. Eventually, by the 1920s, most cars had an internal combustion engine because steam was kind of difficult to operate, right? You need at least a few minutes. In, in, in the best realizations of this technology for an automobile, you need a few minutes before you have steam and, and you can start. And if you go on YouTube, uh, one of the foremost experts and a primary collector of steam-powered vehicles is Jay Leno. Uh, 
the comedian. He has a wide collection and he posted a lot of videos if you're interested in how a steam automobile works and how they were uh, perfected and eventually uh, abandoned. In the case of electrical vehicles of the early uh, 1900s, for example, in New York City, uh, the first taxi cabs were almost exclusively electric. Already at the end of the 1890s, there was a fleet of electrical vehicles, electrical cabs in New York City with a relatively advanced system because of course they relied on batteries and batteries at that time allowed for moderate speeds between 10 and 20 miles per hour and a, a limited range between 15 and 30 miles. But these cabs would go around until their charge was low then they would go back to their base, they would simply replace the batteries, so their batteries would be taken out of the cab, placed somewhere to charge, fresh batteries were introduced, and the cab could go out and continue uh, with their uh, tours. Once again, if you read science fiction novels by Jules Verne, you find that electricity is the uh, source of energy for all the wonderful inventions that he introduced in his novels such as flying ships or the submarines going down uh, into the depths of the ocean going around the world uh, etc and uh, where is electricity uh, gotten from uh, for, for those for example flying uh, or later on you also had a vehicle called Le Pouvant uh, which goes on the road can go in the air, can go on the sea, can go under the sea, moved by electricity. Uh, how does it recharge? Simply extracting electricity from the air, right? Because of course you know that there is electricity in the air. You see the lightning, so there must be electricity and there must be a way to get that out and into uh, the electrical engine of these uh, fabulous vehicles. In reference to invention, you have to keep in mind and of course, again, there is a longer uh, section on this, but I've extracted the, the basic elements. This novel by Francis Bacon, The New Atlantis, which is one of the many utopias that were popular during the 1500s and the 1600s, they're all fashioned after Plato's Republic, right? The idea that you can describe a society that works more efficiently, that um, makes a more efficient use of the talents, the human talents and the material resources of a society. And in this uh, utopian model, uh, novel, you find an educational system called Solomon's House, where uh, you have a specific college for in inventors with all kinds of engines, but the most important engines are those applied to motion because progress is associated with transportation, even as early as 16. 26. And again, it, it, it's, it's not completely removed from uh, what the, the, the principal technology of our times, the internet, where you're moving information and you're moving content, which is in itself a product that can be sold, right? These notes are the sum of two different um, sections, one called Critics of Industrialization, the other called Class. So uh, Carlyle was an intellectual, British intellectual, that in 1829 wrote an essay criticizing uh, industrialization. And what are the elements of his criticism? That industrialization has brought over a mechanical age. And you have to understand this in the context of traditional culture. That is to say, mechanical age replacing the age of the spirit. This idea that you have externalized control, thinking, human expression, right? You have machines dominating over humans, humans serving the machines in the factories and therefore being dehumanized, right? Because all they do is labor intensive, is manual labor with minimal involvement of the mind and no involvement at all of the spirit. The fact that now wealth is what dictates what the relationships in society should be and how social transactions should be performed, right? Uh, that you have 
different levels in society and, and, and those levels become more structured, more rigid. Not that classes did not exist before, but in terms of social transactions, there was a more open attitude uh, than during these periods. The fact that as a result of industrialization, now the body itself is seen as a kind of machine. And this, in fact, has influenced our view of the body to this day. Because to this day, if you read any book on productivity, if you watch any YouTube video on efficiency and productivity, the assumption is that you, if you apply yourself, if you, if you implement the correct routines, you should be able to obtain peak efficiency and peak productivity from your body every day for eight hours a day or however many, some will say four hours, right? And some will say more than eight hours, but this idea that if you discover the secret, the method, the right method, then you can be 100% productive or 110% productive every day, uh, every week, every month, uh, etc. And this idea, which feels very natural to us, is one of the results of the Industrial Revolution. Because the understanding in traditional societies is that the body has a cycle the same way that nature has a cycle. That there are times of productivity and times of rest. There are times of more intensive labor and time of lighter engagement with work and activities, right? And nobody expected someone to be equally productive throughout the whole day, right? To be able to produce the same number of items on an assembly line, to follow the same, the same number of items every minute, every hour, every day, etc. And Raskin, John Raskin was a famous art historian uh, and a very well-known intellectual, a British intellectual of the time, later on during the century emphasized the fact that the work done in factory is mindless. It's a mindless routine that doesn't really add anything to the human uh, experience. And I'll, I'll stop here and continue. Maybe I'll finish on Wednesday because I just have a few minutes left.